All right, good evening. It is 7 o'clock on Thursday, October 13th, 2022. This meeting of the Hingham Select Board is called to order. Let me turn it over to our town administrator, Tom Mayo, who will be emceeing tonight's presentation. Great. Thank you, Bill. Can this thing on? Everybody can hear me, right? I'm not usually accused of being too quiet, so. All right, so we'll get through this. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, this, uh, this is our first of three uh, public information sessions that we'll be holding on this topic. Uh, the intent is to discuss the two proposed projects, the new elementary school and a new public safety facility. Just a quick note on process. I think we're gonna, we have a lot to get through, so I think we're gonna hold off on questions until the end of the presentation, at which time I'll ask everyone uh, who has questions to come to, to the microphone at the center aisle and we'll, we'll kind of walk through everybody's questions that way. And we'll get to everyone, so um, that shouldn't be a problem. So uh, tonight is intended to give the community a thorough understanding of these two projects, uh, or proposed construction projects. To do that, we have invited a number of people uh, of, from varying roles within town government. Uh, we have asked folks from the building committees, both building committees, the school and the public safety facility building committee, their architects, we have department heads, uh, select board members, and school committee members all here to help um, inform everyone of all of these projects. So uh, there's a lot to walk through and a lot of issues uh, being put before the town. Um, at the end of the discussion, our goal is that you all leave here tonight with a full understanding of the projects and their impacts on both your tax bills and the municipal operations. So uh, given that, you see here, this is our, our agenda. Uh, we'll be walking through these categories um, and through the introduction slide. So as I mentioned earlier, you'll hear about the proposed public safety facility at 335 Lincoln Street tonight and the uh, new elementary school over on Downer Ave that's being proposed. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Chief Murphy who will work us, uh, walk us all through the uh, North Fire Station. Good evening, and thank you, Tom. Uh, tonight, I will briefly describe why we need a new fire station and why now. On the screen, you can see a picture of Station 2, which was built in 1941 and is located at 230 North Street. This is the, the station we are discussing relocating. Just some brief history on this particular project. The town has been working to address the fire department station needs for many years. Specifically, this project began 10 years ago with a feasibility study followed by the formation of a fire station building committee in 2015. Ultimately, the committee and select board recognized that the current building and location were not viable for renovation. This decision led the committee to analyze our current and projected call volume and identified the 3A corridor as the best location. Subsequently, the town did a feasibility study and purchased the land at 335 Lincoln Street. From the fire department perspective, we have three major areas in why the current station doesn't meet our needs and why a new station would better serve the department and the town. The first is size. There have been many changes in the fire service since the current building was built, including changes in our equipment and mission. The vehicles have gotten larger and heavier. Unfortunately, we cannot keep the same amount of apparatus as a station as we used to be able to. Another example is there weren't any female firefighters in 1941, and fire departments weren't providing emergency medical services. The physical layout of the building wasn't designed for either. The second major concern with the current building is safety. The leading cause of death for firefighters is cardiac disorder. As you can see in this slide, our station doesn't have an adequate wellness center, which, um, which required us to return a janitor slash storage slash entrance room into a crowded fitness room. If you look on the left, we used to have to remove a ceiling tile so that they could use an elliptical machine in the, uh, one of the bedrooms. Uh, we have since actually put a new ceiling in, so we had to remove the elliptical machine. 
The second leading cause of death for firefighters is cancer. Over the last 20 years, there has been an increase of awareness that when firefighters respond to calls, their equipment, including uniforms and turnout gear, is exposed to carcinogens and other hazardous chemicals. Modern stations are designed to minimize that exposure when they return to the station. Unfortunately, the current building doesn't allow that. The picture on the left is our current uh, layout. You can see all of the gear is crowded in there. On the right is Needham Fire Headquarters where it's spread out, it's allowed to air dry, it's allowed, to, and it's also in a separate area of the station than what we have. The final major concern is the building infrastructure itself. As I mentioned, the current building was built in 1941 and has had only minimal upgrades since. As you can see in this photo, the heating system, electrical, and plumbing are all original. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Now I'll turn it over to, um, to the Chief of Police, David Jones, to walk us through the existing police headquarters. Thank you, Tom. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to briefly walk through some of the key areas of concern with our current police station. I will show why Hingham needs a modern police facility and why we need it now. Our station was never designed for our purpose. It used to be a school. Our functions were placed in the available space like a game of Tetris trying to line up all the pieces. The result is awkward, cramped, and often unsafe. On the screen, you're seeing our public entrance. It's difficult to see. Um, and hard for the public to find, especially at night. In 1998, we ran out of space the day we moved in. Yet in 2011, we gave up substantial space to help build out the new regional dispatch facility. The photo on the left shows what was first designated as a holding area. Out of necessity, it was changed into storage for our motorcycles, vehicle maintenance equipment, and supplies. The photo on the right shows the staff entrance area, which is now used as open and unsecured storage. This room was first designed as a roll call room where shift briefings are held. Now it serves many different functions, such as our only training space, our officer's meal area, our community room, a backup space for interviews, and the only area where we can hold non-status offenders. If the room is being used for one reason, it cannot be used for any of the other functions. The photo on the left shows our records area where the public comes to get copies of accident and incident reports. It's a converted employee entrance where the public is forced to interact with our staff through a mail slot in a public stairway, creating a problematic space to discuss sensitive and private information. The photo on the right-hand side shows our armory which in this photo has most of its equipment out for a training day. You'll see there's no proper storage for weapons, ammunition, or training gear. There's also no ventilation or plumbing needed, which is needed for cleaning weapons and equipment, creating a safety risk to our staff. These photos show our locker rooms, which are too small and not designed for public safety personnel. We can't provide lockers for our 25 part-time officers, nor can we support any more female staff in the locker rooms. Officers must store their gear on top of lockers, under benches, and in common areas throughout the station. These photos show the staff and department vehicle parking areas. We have 21 parking, or two, there are 21 parking spaces for 23 department vehicles. At shift changes, both the incoming and outgoing officers' personal vehicles must be parked in the driveway, making two-way travel impossible and dangerous in emergency situations. There is one garage bay that cannot accommodate an ambulance and it is also used for storage, creating a safety risk when entering with an arrestee. These photos show two of our cramped office spaces. There is no room for growth. The bottom photo is a small office which hosts two of our licensing officers, our animal control officer, our mental health clinician, and our domestic violence advocate. This last slide shows our public lobby area. As you can see, there's no privacy for anyone wanting to speak with an officer confidentially about a crime or other sensitive matter, and we have no other private interview spaces. This is the same area that detainees are released into 
which is a serious safety concern when a victim or witness to the arrested person's offense is waiting in the lobby. Thank you all, and my staff and I will be available after to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Chief. Now we will ask Donna Smallwood from the Public Safety Facility Building Committee to walk us through the new proposed, the, through the proposed new design. Thank you, good evening. The Chiefs have spoken to the why of this project. I'd like to speak to the how. What we have now is woefully undersized facilities, um, lacking the kinds of configuration and spaces that modern firefighting and policing require. What we bring to you is a proposal uh, at the November 1st special town meeting and at the ballot for a combined public safety facility. We would move the North Fire Station and police headquarters to one optimally located uh, facility and along the way, we think end up with um, a better product. The plan is for a modernized police and fire service complex, realizing operational efficiencies and cost savings. It will work better not only for our staff, but for our community. We can achieve cost savings um, in part because uh, of building one building for the two departments. We only need one building lobby. We only need one set of building support functions and the design includes some shared facilities. For example, um, there are shared training facilities and exercise facilities that will allow our public safety team to maintain their health and enhance their skills. The bunk rooms included in the new design provide the appropriate privacy for both male and female firefighters who both work and live in this building. It has sized and configured spaces conducive to effective public safety work, including meeting rooms where our officers can conduct confidential police business with victims and family members in privacy. I did a little research. When, um, when our community built North Fire Station, our population was 8,000 people. When the police team moved into what was the middle school in 2000, we were a population of 20,000 people. Today we are 24,000 people. That's a 20% population increase since the police moved to town hall and a tripling of our population since we built the fire station. The proposed facility will meet both the current needs of the department and the needs for, for our community for the 50 plus years that we expect the building to continue. The Public Safety Building Committee hired Castle Booz Associates, uh, an architectural firm with deep experience in Massachusetts building public safety facilities, and Hill International as our owner's project managers. Those are experts that are our, our town's eyes on the project and enhance our, our local expertise. The Building Committee visited public safety facilities in other communities and learned what worked and also sometimes what didn't work. We worked intensively with the chiefs to understand the, the department's programmatic needs. And then we designed, refined, redesigned, re-refined, re and um, eventually reduced the building size 13% from the original proposal. So let's take a look at the resulting uh, proposed building, which is 49,000 square feet. In this rendering, we're standing uh, on Essington Street in the shipyard with our backs to the commuter boat parking. On the right in the image is Fresh Market. This is the main entrance for the building. It's three stories. Um, and the, the main door is right in the center of the building. That's where I'll go when I need to work with one of the chiefs on something. Um, in general, what you see on the left are, are police operations uh, spaces, and on the right are the fire operations spaces. Inclu uh, uh, take a look at those windows on the upper right. Those are the firefighters' bunk rooms. Um, the design has an industrial feel, which we think echoes the shipyard's storied history. 
Um, it's brick at the bottom, kind of anchoring the building to the, to the site. And what appears gray in the rendering is metal paneling. Throughout, the designer is specifying durable, energy efficient materials appropriate not only to the building's use, but to its location near the water. Take a walk with me now around the corner to the Routes 3A uh, side of the building, where it appears to be two stories because the site slopes up so dramatically that, that it appears two stories on this side. This view is dominated by the five apparatus bays for the, for the uh, fire department, a feature that was critical to Chief Murphy and his team because it means that the four trucks and ambulances that are assigned to this station uh, have immediate access to Route 3A when an emergency happens. The area to the right in this rendering is police operations. They do have some windows, we just can't see them in this angle. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit to the schedule. Uh, we have completed the feasibility work for this project. We've complete, completed several of the earlier design phases, and we learned at last night's meeting that we're 70% 70, 70 done with the pre-construction bid documents. With our neighbor's support in November, this building is ready to go out to bid in early 2023 with an anticipated occupation in fall of 2024. Oops, there we go. Ah, we have one last slide than I thought we did. Um, and uh, in which case I will just uh, fumble here for a moment and then tip my hat to, um, I'd like to tip my hat to my colleagues on the Public Safety Building Committee. Um, we have a, a very experienced and knowledgeable chair in Bob Garrity, uh, a committed vice chair in Paul Healy, and members um, Joe Kelly, Telly Lauder, Bruce McElhoney, and Andy Touche, along with Chiefs Jones and Murphy and their lieutenants who have been with us at every meeting and working with us every step along the way. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to work with you on this project. I would like to speak, to take a minute to speak to the building's energy efficiency. This is an aspect of the project that we worked with both the planning board and Hingham Net Zero. We bring you a proposal for an electric building, 97% electric. Only one small area, the apparatus bay, will need to be heated by gas because the technology isn't quite there yet to uh, deal with the substantial heat loss when you open those big, big doors. Um, the flat roof on the building is designed and will be built to be solar ready, meaning all the infrastructure is in place and therefore it will be easier in the future to add solar panels to the roof. The design includes eight electric vehicle charging stations for both our public safety team and for public use. And the infrastructure will be in place throughout the entire structure for the addition of additional charging stations in the future. The result is a green building helping us meet our town's energy and environmental needs. In conclusion, Four previous town meetings have supported this project with funding for its design phases. A yes vote from our community in November will get the project built. We see this as one right-sized building ad ad addressing the critical needs of the police and the fire departments now and in the future. A win, win, win. And the next speaker will speak to that third win. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. Now I'll turn over to select board member, uh, Joe Fisher, who will talk a little bit about the tertiary benefits of the public safety facility. Thank you, Tom. Uh, you've heard about the needs, I'll move closer to the mic. You've heard about the needs of the fire and police departments, and you've heard how the facility meets those needs. I want to talk about the potential benefits to the town after fire and police have moved to the new facility. What are the potential benefits? Well, with respect to the North Fire Station, which will then be vacant, 
uh, it can be used to support education and training programs like TRACES, which is currently a program at the Hingham High School that has been displaced because there's no facility right now to, to house them. Um, we will also be exploring the potential of either leasing or selling that property. With respect to the Hingham Police Station, once the police have moved out, that would leave approximately 15,000 square feet available for redesign to support and expanding the Senior Center, which is a high priority for the town. Um, both facilities uh, really offer the space that will be available, that will become available uh, for the town to use as it sees fit, uh, particularly with respect to the police department, once the police are gone, that will free up a significant number of parking spots. One other point I do want to mention, uh, the town is really in fierce competition to attract employees and having these new facilities will be a real bonus and assist us in bringing in the quality staff that we need to support the town. Tom, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Joe. Okay, now I'll turn it over to Ray Estes, who will speak on the, uh, from the school building committee, who will walk us through matters related to the foster schools. Good evening. Is that good, Bonnard? I don't think I really need the mic, but that's all right. <laughs> um, so two tough acts to follow. Uh, I feel like I've been following Donna for months, um, and she's very good. So, um, But glad to be here tonight to walk you through what our committee has been working on for over five years. Uh, we were formed in 2017 uh, by town meeting. Um, so here's the existing uh, foster school that was built in 1951. There were additions in the early 70s, uh, 50, I think 57, the early 70s. Uh, there was some work done um, in 2008 to 2010 to kind of breathe new life uh, into the building. And um, at the same time, there was money invested in another elementary school in town, PRS. That money invested at PRS is obvious. It's evident when you go to that school. It's very hard to find when you go to Foster, and that's because a lot of that money got eaten up by ADA compliance upgrades and um, other renovations that are not easily uh, seen. Um, as a result, there are a number of deficiencies um, that continue uh, over the years. Many of the windows that were earmarked to be replaced, for instance, never got replaced at that time. Um, we, as I said, have been working on this for quite some time. This is a building that I think has two key issues that have plagued the foster educational community for decades. One has to do with the facility itself and the mechanical systems, and the other has to do with space deficiencies. Um, with respect to mechanical systems, they're aging. A lot of them are original, um, the boilers, the steam pipe distribution uh, mechanism, the electrical components, um, and a lot of them have failed over the years. Um, with respect to uh, the, the spaces, there are just small and deficient spaces um, that no longer accommodate 21st century learning. Uh, and there are many, many uh, problems with uh, the ability to deliver curriculum uh, in today's um, uh, educational environment. Um, just following the timeline, just to let every, everybody know that as well as our committee working on this, we've gone to town meeting numerous times uh, with respect to this project um, and other issues surrounding uh, Foster uh, Elementary School. Um, as I said, in 2017, uh, initial feasibility money was authorized uh, to pursue uh, a project, hopefully in partnership with the MSBA, Massachusetts School Building Authority. Um, we had not yet been invited to the program at that time, and we were hopeful that we would, um, but money was appropriated to engage in a feasibility uh, study to begin to develop uh, work um, that, would, that would go toward that goal. Um, our school building committee was formed, as I indicated, in 2019, uh, $350,000 was appropriated as a kind of capital fund to address uh, ongoing maintenance um, and um, uh, infrastructure concerns. 
Um, there had been some significant issues with the steam pipe distribution uh, mechanism the year before that displaced students, uh, caused the evacuation of the school, um, uh, and um, that needed to be addressed and there just wasn't money in the school budget to address it in the ordinary course. Um, in 2020, after uh, receiving an invitation from the MSBA in late 2019, we discovered doing some research that the cost of a feasibility study for an elementary school was becoming more expensive. An additional appropriation was um, awarded at town meeting in 2020 to help augment that. Um, and uh, just recently in 2022, as we have been working on design uh, for this project, uh, in order to continue our work and keep to an aggressive schedule, there was um, essentially uh, an advance made um, on money that we were anticipating um, um, uh, being awarded uh, in, in town meeting uh, coming up. So interim funding was authorized in order to continue uh, design development work at that time um, that would get us to where we are today. So just a, a, a brief timeline. Where we are right now is the red line in the, in the middle. Um, we are uh, currently uh, in design development. This goes schematic design. The feasibility phase uh, was completed last year. The schematic phase was completed last year. The MSBA um, approved our preferred design uh, to move forward with a new school. As we began the process with the MSBA, we had to examine a number of different options, an addition renovation, um, a new school. Um, you know, we, we also looked at you know, options to relocate uh, a school in a different part of North Hingham, and there were no other uh, areas available to do so. Um, so right now, we've, as we've gotten through schematic design and we're in design development now, we are approaching um, the first of two phases. We have split this project up into two phases because there's a great deal of site work that's necessary in order to position a new school behind the existing school. Um, for those of you familiar with the site, Otis Hill uh, is a tremendous resource, um, but it also presents uh, somewhat of a constraint. Uh, of the 39 acres that comprise this property, only seven of that is developable. Um, so it, it definitely creates a, a, a tight site uh, within which to work. Um, as we have been working through design development, um, we are focused on um, uh, going to bid on phase one, which is going to be the site work. That will prepare um, uh, the site for uh, construction. It will take fill from a portion of Otis Hill and build up the site. Um, it'll also create an access drive that will go around the school, not only for construction access and public safety access, but remain uh, as the main point of access around the school when it's in operation. Um, and we decided to split up into two packages because it's a great deal of work that needs to be done, and we are on an aggressive schedule. This community has been waiting many, many years uh, for a solution to the problems that have plagued uh, this, this building. Um, and we're trying to move as quickly as we can and as aggressively as we can. So we decided to split it up into the two packages. Uh, we're going out to bid on the site work, actually uh, submitting um, the bid package uh, in a few weeks, a couple of weeks. Um, that will uh, hopefully uh, be awarded after a successful town meeting and ballot vote uh, on November 1st and 8th, respectively. Um, the second um, we, after, the, after the site work begins in early December, um, we will continue with uh, design development and, and finalization of that and development of construction documents for the actual building. And um, we intend to uh, refine those documents and uh, proceed with additional cost estimates through the winter and go out to bid on the vertical, constru vertical construction of the building, uh, I believe, in April. Um, the timeline for construction is about 13 to 15 months, and we anticipate opening 
a new school in the fall of 24. So it's going to be a big year in Hingham in 2024, particularly in the fall with a new public safety building and a new elementary school in Crow Point. Um, so here's some images of some of the, you know, I spoke about kind of two overarching issues that have plagued this school, one being the mechanical systems and the other being space issues. So talking about some of the mechanical systems, here are some images of some of the electrical components. Um, my architect is terrific. He prepared little red bullet points, and those are the overarching themes of each of the, uh, the images that we see here. So these are electrical, outdated electrical systems and overtaxed. We've put some money into them over the years, uh, most recently, uh, I think in the last uh, four or five years. Um, but there's a, there's a point to which you cannot throw good money after bad, as those of you who, who repair old homes know, at some point you have to replace um, systems. Uh, parts become obsolete and hard to get. Um, in addition, um, the electrical components rust because of steam leaks in the steam pipe distribution um, infrastructure. Here are some images of um, what is, seems to be constantly under repair, um, some of the piping that is underneath the building uh, in a crawl space area um, that service, serves the uh, steam pipe distribution uh, mechanism. Um, it's, it's original. Uh, there have been a lot of repairs uh, in the last five to seven years. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, 2018, there was a significant issue in December that forced the evacuation of the entire building to the high school for an entire day um, because the heat um, could not be turned on. There are also issues with the, the inability to control the heat at times. So whether it's too cold or too hot, um, that is an increasing problem and difficult to manage and maintain. So as a result of kind of the deficiencies of the mechanical systems, there are impacts to learning, right? Um, the HVAC the AC system, um, you know, there is no air conditioning per se, except in, I think, the main office. Um, the, uh, you know, the leaks that I, that I mentioned, um, they create hazards because of, uh, of those leaks. Um, there are a number of other ancillary uh, issues that result that, you know, impact the ceiling and other uh, areas. As I mentioned, the force relocation, um, inadequate ventilation. Um, those of you may remember in, uh, uh, as part of the COVID pandemic, um, there was a relocation of two grade levels from Foster to the old St. Jerome Catholic School in Weymouth for a period of months. Uh, the town had to lease that property and outfit it um, that was because there was inadequate ventilation in a number of classrooms, which we'll talk about in the, in the space uh, um, section. Um, there are no windows. There is no access, direct access to hallways in those rooms. And as a result, in uh, concerns about um, you know, the, the inability to breathe fresh air um, with COVID um, uh, looming, um, there was a relocation uh, to to that Catholic school for a period of time. Um, this has also really impacted um, you know, other school buildings because of the need to draw resources from them to service foster. Some of the space issues um, that, as I mentioned, inadequate fresh air, uh, has impacts on student learning and attentiveness. Um, in, uh, ceiling fans have been installed in order to try to improve the air circulation in some of these spaces. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, um, the rental space um, relocation in Weymouth um, was done uh, in order to uh, alleviate that issue temporarily. So studies have proven that inadequate natural light negatively impacts test scores. That's just one factoid. Um, the reality is that some of these rooms are, can be very disruptive. Students actually have to go through one room, which may be occupied by a class, to get to another. There's no direct hallway access to a number of these rooms, and then no windows uh, as well. That is not only um, 
inappropriate learning uh, atmosphere, but it's, it's uh, inconducive to um, appropriate learning. These are some other, some images of other spaces that are utilized for things that they're not really intended for. Um, small group learning occurs in windowless alcoves. A lot of meeting space uh, is used, which is not ideal. It doesn't have, uh, they don't have doors. They don't have necessary privacy. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's become an increasing problem. These are images of the gym and the cafeteria. So in the other three elementary schools, while the gyms are not perfect, they're certainly much nicer than this and, and normally sized. This is a tiny, tiny gymnasium that doesn't even have a wood floor. You cannot play any sort of real basketball game or any other um, you know, type of ball game in that space. Um, the cafeteria is significantly undersized. It requires six lunch periods instead of the normal two to three in the other elementary schools. That requires lunch to start, I think, as early as 10.45 in the morning. In addition to that, in the other elementary schools, they have cafetoriums, which not only serve as, as the lunch area, but also uh, for all school gatherings and presentations, um, music events, and things like that. There is no space in Foster to accommodate the entire student body for any sort of all-school uh, event. If they want the entire student body together, they have to meet outside. <clears throat> so draining limited resources. So the cost of maintaining an old building can get quite expensive. And as a result of these old systems, the boilers, the steam pipe distribution uh, mechanism, and single pane windows, there is uh, also a lack, uh, there, there is a, a, a huge uh, amount of uh, energy that is wasted. Um, there are costs associated with uh, the utilities uh, that are uh, more expensive than they would be otherwise, and we have found doing an energy model, as we have prepared uh, through our design for the new school, that it's actually going to be less expensive to operate the new school, which is, I believe, 40% larger than the existing school. Um, as we move to the new school, which we've been working on for several months, this is a site plan. This is a design that's still in development because we're not quite done with permitting. We expect to have votes from those permitting boards uh, as early as perhaps next week or the week after. Um, Certainly, we hope to have them secured by town meeting. Um, so this design is as it currently is today. Um, it, it could change a little bit, but it's for the most part uh, as, as final as we can, we can say it is as of today. Um, so this design meets all of the educational and community needs of this neighborhood. As part of our planning process uh, for this project, as required by the MSBA, as well as the Department of Education in uh, uh, elementary and secondary education in Massachusetts, we were required to develop an educational plan. That educational plan is kind of a roadmap to how we're going to del deliver the curriculum in this building. And it's an evolving uh, document and concept um, that I think the, the school district is really excited about having space to accommodate some of the programmatic uh, initiatives that really haven't been possible in the past. Um, this site uh, improves traffic safety. Right now, it's a very tight site. There's inadequate parking. Um, sight lines are, are not great. Um, the site is a very challenging site, as I mentioned. It borders on wetlands areas, um, also river uh, uh, nearby the upland that I mentioned of Otis Hill. Um, and we have reviewed studies um, that have projected that over time, as you've seen with storms and sea level rise across the country, um, that is something that we should try to anticipate 50 years hence. We have taken that into account, and the design essentially builds the site up, as I mentioned, to take it out of a future floodplain. So the new building will not be 
uh, susceptible to flooding as projected by the studies that we have reviewed um, thus far. We're excited to be able to provide um, outdoor space, um, not only for play, but also that uh, can incorporate some of our curriculum. Uh, as part of the design, you'll see at the bottom uh, the outdoor classroom or wilderness classroom, as it's been called by our landscape architect, is intended to be used by the field science curriculum in the fifth grade, where classes can get up close uh, and examine wetlands areas while staying, uh, keeping a safe distance and not damaging those uh, natural resource areas. This is uh, the first floor site plan, and we have some key programmatic highlights uh, just to review. Um, the, the classrooms, so this is, this is a, uh, a building that is going to be approximately 126,000 square feet. It's designed for kindergarten through fifth grade. It will also expand the pre-kindergarten program that's currently housed at East Elementary. Um, and it's, it's, it's uh, designed to accommodate a design enrollment of 605 uh, that was set by the MSBA uh, about two years ago at this point. Um, the, the gym is going to be an appropriately sized gymnasium that can accommodate all sorts of activities and sporting events. Um, all of the spaces uh, in this school are designed to comply with MSBA space requirements. V virtually none of the spaces in the current Foster Elementary School comply with those space requirements. And as a result, we have a larger building that's necessary not only to comply with those requirements, but also to provide adequate space to deliver the curriculum, which we haven't had. Um, the cafeteria will be appropriately sized so we can go back to uh, hopefully the two lunch periods um, a little bit later in the day than 1045 to start. Um, and it'll have, it'll have a stage. It'll be a cafetorium. It'll be able to accommodate the entire student body for an event, for an all-school meeting, um, for a, a, a concert or uh, other performance that, that maybe parents could attend. Um, the school also includes space for a couple of educational programs um, that Hingham hasn't been able to uh, offer uh, in district previously uh, because we haven't had the space. Those are a, thera a therapeutic learning center and, la and language-based uh, classroom. Um, those will enable us to deliver the services needed to uh, students who need them um, in our district and not have to send them uh, outside. Um, the community features, I, as I mentioned, the gym will accommodate not only the curriculum, uh, physical education classes and, and other activities within the school, but also serve the community. Um, many of our schools in town are used by uh, youth sport expro sports programs, uh, and we would anticipate that this gymnasium could be used uh, the same way. Um, there is a multi-purpose room uh, on the first floor that is going to house the field science program. In addition to that, it's going to um, accommodate an expanded kids in action program, which is an early, uh, it's, it's a, a very popular uh, after school, before and after school program uh, in Hingham um, that is um, currently housed at a couple of the elementary schools, but we'll be able to expand it here to North Hingham. So we're excited about that opportunity. Um, there are other amenities as well that will provide um, you know, benefits to the, to the larger community. This is, uh, these are the second and third floor plans which show the classroom neighborhoods. So. Each of, each of the grade levels has five, is designed with five classrooms to accommodate students, to keep class size um, at a reasonable level. Um, and each of them, each of the grade levels is, is arranged in a neighborhood with a common space uh, for each. That will allow for collaborative uh, project-based learning and instruction. Um, and it's an exciting opportunity to be able to kind of get uh, the kids from different classes together to work on something together. Um, as I said, in the, in the existing foster school, there are a number of classrooms that don't have natural light, that don't have direct access to hallways. Um, 
the new school design has all of those things and more. It's, it's a robustly insulated uh, building, uh, just as uh, the public safety building is designed to be all electric, so is the new elementary school. Um, we have uh, worked on a design for a geothermal um, uh, heat pump system uh, with uh, a well field um, that will uh, serve as the um, HVAC uh, heat and uh, air conditioning or conditioned air system. Um, depending on costs when the bids come in, um, we may be looking at an air sourced heat pump system, which is um, precisely what the public safety building is using. So depending on costs, um, we will make that decision uh, at the appropriate time. Both of them uh, use all electric. There are no fossil fuels. There's no gas line that's going to run to this new building. There's no fuel oil that's going to run to this building. Um, it's all going to be uh, electric generated. Um, and we're excited for that and the lower month, uh, lower maintenance costs um, and utility costs that are going to go with that. Um, as you can see, the, there are a number of light wells um, that are designed uh, to allow natural light to come in. That'll reduce electric demand during the day. Um, likewise, with uh, the public safety building, our roof is going to be uh, uh, is designed and will be built solar ready to accommodate uh, a solar panel uh, array. Um, again, depending on uh, the costs uh, of that and what the bids come in at, we may be able to afford those panels with contingency funds, depending on where we are in budget. Uh, if not, that's going to be something that we have to look at uh, as a future expenditure uh, paid for in some other way. This is kind of a look at the, at the uh, bird's eye look at the building with potentially solar panels installed on the roof. Um, there is a significant uh, area reserved um, for those solar panels, which could fuel uh, almost a quarter of the um, school's power needs. Um, so we're hopeful that we can afford to install those panels. We've been in discussions with HMLP about other options to get those panels on the building because we think it'll be a, a great benefit uh, to Hingham. This is a, a view of, uh, of the building. We are using uh, as many natural materials as we can um, in, in, in the out exterior um, facade and, and, and makeup of the building. Brick, um, cementitious clapboard, clapboards, um, as well as slate. Um, we wanted to blend in with the, not only the neighborhood, but also the beautiful uh, site um, attributes that surround it. Um, it's set back from the street. As I said, it's going to be built behind the existing school. Um, it's a compact three-story design, um, as I said, using man-made and, and very durable natural materials. Um, this is kind of a, a, another view looking from Downer Ave. Um, it's, 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 it's really going to be a beautiful school. We spent a lot of time on the materials uh, and the colors. Uh, we took a look at different renderings from different views to see how it would blend in um, because we recognize it's going to be a much larger building than is there now. So we wanted to make sure that it looks uh, as, as pleasant as it possibly can. In terms of budget, so this is an expensive project. There's no doubt about that. Um, as the folks working on the public safety project have seen, this is probably the worst time to be building a new building. It's unfortunate, um, but we're doing the best we can to keep costs down. We have already done uh, value engineering that has reduced costs um, by well over a million dollars. Um, and when we were faced with rising cost estimates, we went back to the drawing board and made some additional uh, cuts in order to stay uh, within the budget that was approved. Um, so this, the cost of this will be approximately $113 million. That'll be in the warrant article that you'll, look, that you'll see and vote on on November 1st. Um, there will be a debt exclusion on the ballot as the public safety project will have as well on November 8th. Um, Hingham Share 
uh, of this um, is 100, what is it, 100 versus, 100 minus uh, 40.54, so what is that, 59.46%. Um, the MSBA is, uh, has set a reimbursement rate for us that includes some incentive points because of um, maintenance plans and the lead silver accreditation that we uh, expect to achieve because of the energy efficiencies and other uh, uh, green attributes of the building. Um, the, uh, while, the, while the percentage is set at 40.54%, um, because of certain caps uh, and thresholds that the MSBA has in place, the effective reimbursement rate will actually be less than that, and I'll go through that in detail in just a second. Um, ultimately, um, the potential grant from the MSBA based on the project budget that was approved uh, at the end of August is approximately $25 uh, million. So here you can see the, the, the project budget set out 113, 335, 749. You can see the breakdown of the reimbursement rate set by the MSBA and what that includes. And as I mentioned, that reimbursement rate is effectively reduced. Um, unfortunately, uh, we are facing probably the highest construction costs we have seen. Um, a cap of 360 uh, set by the MSBA is exceeded by construction costs that we're seeing these days at approximately $600 per square foot. So that unfortunate reality is effectively reducing uh, our reimbursement rate and increasing the, the cost to Hingham. Um, there is a site construction cost cap as well at 8% of building costs. Uh, and because of the challenging site that we do have, um, the, the reimbursement is effectively reduced uh, as well. Um, there are other caps with respect to furniture, figures, and equipment uh, per student uh, allocation for that. Um, and uh, the MSBA does not um, include uh, reimbursement for um, photovoltaic or solar array installations. Um, so with that, I would hand it back to Tom. Great. Thank you very much, Ray. So now we will look at our financing plan. And for these, um, for, uh, for these projections, we will ask our assistant town administrator for finance, Michelle Montsegur, to walk us through that analysis. Thank you, Tom. So there are many considerations that went into developing the financial plan for these two large capital projects. We understand that this is a significant investment for the town. As this slide shows, and as Ray just talked about, the total cost for the new elementary school is about $113 million, which is being offset by a sizable grant of $25 million from the MSBA. Um, the town expects to borrow approximately $88 million for the new school. For the new public safety facility, we expect to borrow about $48 million, so that comes to a total anticipated borrowing of about $136 million for both projects. Given the size of these projects, the town plans to use a debt exclusion to finance the new facilities. A debt exclusion is a temporary property tax increase to fund specific capital projects. We've tried to structure the financing plan to mitigate the tax impact on residents to the extent possible. Um, first, the town secured a $25 million grant that we've mentioned to support the school project, so that directly reduces the costs of rebuilding Foster to taxpayers. Second, we're proposing to use $7 million from our unassigned fund balance, this is the town's savings account, again to offset the tax impact in the early years of debt service when we expect debt service costs to peak. So this again directly reduces the cost of these projects to Hingham taxpayers. In addition, the town has maintained the highest credit rating possible from the three major credit rating agencies for 20 years. Our AAA rating gives us access to the, to the lowest interest rates available, again, helping to minimize costs. Given the size of the projects, we plan to spread out repayment of the debt over a 30-year window um, because this would make it as affordable as possible for residents on an annual basis. 30 years is the maximum that's allowed by the state, and it's the term that most other communities are using for large building projects like these. 
Finally, and Liz will speak to this more, the town offers over 12 different property tax exemptions and relief programs, and we're making a concerted effort to get the word out about those resources so that the folks in town who need them the most can access those programs. So using current interest rate projections provided by the town's financial advisors, assuming that we're borrowing for both projects over the 30-year period that I mentioned, and applying the $7 million from our savings account, this chart shows the estimated tax impact on residents. Here you can see three different levels of assessed values in the columns. So the 25th percentile is about 552,000. The median property value in town right now is in the middle about 740,000. And the 75th percentile is just over a million dollars. At each level, what you see here, we're showing um, the average annual tax increase for the first 10 years of debt service, which would be FY24 through FY33. And FY24 starts next July 1. Looking at the median assessed property value of about 740,000, we estimate that the average property tax increase for both projects combined would be about $592 per year for the first 10 years. If you're in the 25th percentile, that drops to $441 per year. And if you're in the 75th percentile, it rises to about $824 per year. We also show here in the gray boxes on the bottom the estimated impact of a potential $4.9 million override, uh, operating override. Obviously, this has not been discussed or decided yet. That's something that will be considered as part of annual town meeting this coming spring, but we wanted to be transparent and make sure that people were aware of this. I see some of you guys squinting at the screen. All of this information I have in some handouts, it's available on the website as well, um, just to make sure that people can access it. And for anyone looking for some more granular data, I know people can't read this right now. Um, <laughs> we've posted a table on our town meeting website, and again, I have handouts. It shows you the 10-year estimates by year for those three different assessed property values um, if you want to see the tax impact of these projects and the override. But please feel free to see me after the presentation as well with any questions. Thanks, Tom. Great. Thank you very much, Michelle. Now I'll turn it over to Select Board Member Liz Klein to walk us through the work of the Sustainable Budgeting Task Force uh, and the work that they did and how that informs these projects. Thanks so much, Tom. The Sustainable Budget Task Force was created in September 2021. It's comprised of the following members, Select Board, School Committee, Assistant Town Administrator for Finance, School Business Manager, School Superintendent, and former Advisory Committee Chair. The Sustainable Budget Task Force reviewed detailed economic, demographic, and financial information to meet its charge of developing options to facilitate a sustainable five-year financial forecast for the town for fiscal years 2023 through 2027. Part of the task force work focused on assessing the impact increased taxes and fees will have on taxpayers and residents, including the tax impact of debt exclusions related to large capital projects under consideration. The task force looked at how Hingham compares to our 19 benchmark communities in terms of several tax indicators to better understand if we're aligned in terms of tax bills. I'm going to share a few of those data points tonight. The complete report can be found on the town website. The task force looked at average single family tax bills across the benchmark communities. Hingham remains in the middle at the number 11 spot. This graph shows the projected FY26 average single family tax bill with both foster school and the public safety facility debt exclusion projects and a $4.9 million override included. As you can see, Hingham still remains around the middle of our benchmark communities. Please keep in mind that this is a conservative estimate because it assumes all of the other benchmark towns have not had any tax increases in the form of debt exclusions or overrides, simply because we don't have that data. The task force looked at average single family tax bills as a percentage of Department of Revenue income per capita across the 20 benchmark communities. On this measure, Hingham lands on the low end in the number 17 spot. While per capita income is an imperfect metric, since extremely high earners can pull that average upwards, this indicator does point to some capacity 
to absorb tax increases relative to this group of peer communities. We also looked back 15 years to see how income per capita and average single family tax bills have trended in Hingham. As shown here, the average single family tax bill in Hingham increased 69% between 2008 and 2022, while income per capita grew by 106%. Throughout the 15 year period, Hingham average single family tax bills trended just below the average of the 19 benchmark communities, but that gap has start started to widen slightly in recent years. Being cognizant of not knowing everyone's individual situation and their personal capacity to pay increased taxes, the town offers a variety of programs to mitigate the impact of property tax increases and has aggressively pursued programs that offer tax relief to our most vulnerable citizens. In FY22, the town implemented a new senior means tested property tax exemption that was approved by the 2019 annual town meeting. As the 2019 warrant stated, this exemption was for a specifically identified group of Hingham seniors, those long time residents who meet certain income and asset criteria to help alleviate an escalating tax, tax burden that could force those on fixed incomes to sell their homes. For more information on any of the tax relief exemptions and programs, or to see if you qualify, please reach out to the assessing office. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Now I'll turn to the chair of the select board, Bill Ramsey, who will walk us through some of the outreach efforts that we've made to date. Uh, thank you, Tom. In the past five years, a tremendous amount of work has gone on into both of these projects to take us uh, into November 1st. These, pro these work includes 40 select board meetings, 23 school committee meetings, almost 60 advisory committee meetings, 133 building committee meetings, 17 site tours, and we've had eight town meeting votes um, regarding both of these projects. Slide. And since the summer of 2022, uh, we've engaged uh, in a comprehensive outreach program to educate residents about uh, the town meeting vote and the ballot vote. Uh, these have included a mailer to all residents that went out this past week. Tonight is the first of three public information sessions. Uh, we have four public tours scheduled of the Foster School, five public tours scheduled for the North, uh, North Fire Station, Police Station and Senior Center. Uh, we've had uh, weekly videos, uh, web-based videos answering questions about both projects and uh, to date we've had uh, 1,100 hits on our town meeting um, web page. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Okay, <coughs> right when I got to talk, I lose, I can't talk. Okay, so to wrap up, I'll walk through a couple of slides uh, pretty quick and uh, speak to the town meeting on November 1st and the ballot on November 8th. So this was what we'll see for warrant articles, obviously abbreviated. Uh, this is the order that the warrant will be in. We'll consider first the foster school project, uh, the new elementary school project, the new public safety project, and then a uh, third article to, that Michelle talked about, which will be transferring some unassigned fund balance to a new stabilization fund uh, and making that available for these, uh, for these two projects. This, what, what you see here is a sample ballot from uh, a state ballot that will be uh, used on November 8th. If you turn over to the back of the ballot at the bottom, questions four, uh, five and six rather, are our two questions that require a majority, um, a majority vote uh, to pass. Now, I, 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 I'm remiss in not mentioning that the, um, the vote at town meeting needs to be a two thirds vote because they're both debt exclusions. So uh, for vote for uh, articles one and two. Okay, so this, this is the ballot question that you're gonna see on November 8th. It's gobbledygook, it's state required language. Uh, if you look down the bottom, what this basically says is that a yes vote will allow the town to borrow funds to build the two projects and a no vote will not. This one was for Foster, 
The next slide uh, speaks to um, the public safety facility, same concept. A yes vote allows us to borrow funds and a no vote does not. Next slide. So just before we go to uh, questions from the public, I just I, I note that the chair of the advisory committee uh, is in the room, uh, Mr. George Danis. And uh, George, if you want to take a moment and report out the results of your committee. I have no slides. <laughs> well, thank you, Tom, and uh, thank you to everyone for coming out this evening. The two capital spending articles that we will consider and vote on November 1st represent the most significant capital investment projects in the history of our town. I would like to take a minute to describe the process ADCOM went through to evaluate and ultimate, ultimately vote unanimously in favor of these projects. Um, as Bill said, both projects have a long history with ADCOM. Over 60, or almost 60 meetings in the last few years. That's more than I would have thought, but it does it seem like each project came up quite often. <laughs> Over that time, ADCOM has got to know these projects pretty well. We've developed an understanding of the size, the scope, and the need for these projects. ADCOM has supported and recommended these projects through every stage of the process to date and has unanimously voted in support of the articles that we will vote November 1st. As a process, once the, once the plans for the November 1st meeting were, were announced, ADCOM began, began the work of reviewing the proposed articles. To facilitate the process, ADCOM assigns teams of liaisons to each of the project. The, uh, the, the goal and the objective and the work of the liaison is to familiarize themselves with the project, the pros and the cons, to speak to the advocates and to those who oppose the projects. We work very closely with the chairs of both um, building committees and they report their findings to ADCOM. And another, another goal, another, another, another job of the liaisons is to draft the comments and the recommended motions that appear in the warrant. As part of the evaluation process, we have held eight meetings since uh, July on these projects. These meetings have included two meetings each with the building committee uh, for foster and public safety. We have had an additional five meetings where ADCOM has discussed the projects and reviewed and discussed and, um, and edited the comments and the recommended motions. Also, in, recommend, in recognition of some of the citing issues that both projects faced, we have been regular attendees at meetings of both the Planning Board and the Conservation Committee. Finally, in recognition of the cost of these projects, we have asked Tom and Michelle to come before ADCOM and to present the findings of um, and the work of the Capital Market Advisors Group on how these projects would be financed and what the impact to the taxpayer would be. Um, that's sort of a brief overview of what ADCOM did on these projects, but ultimately, ultimately it led, as I said earlier, to a unanimous decision to support these projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Thanks, Tom. Two questions? Oh, what about, um, we have the chairman, the chair of the school committee here too, Michelle Ayer. Michelle, do you want to add anything? Did you want to? Yeah, I think Okay, I want to give you a chance. Yeah. All right. Yeah, um, yeah I'd be happy to field any questions and anyone who has any questions, please come up to the mic and yeah, right state your name and address. Front, front row. Here. Come on up, sir. John. Just can you scooch that off to the center of the aisle, the microphone? Yeah, just bring it to the center of the aisle. Sorry. So Bill, be Hi, uh, Peter Goldstein. So, excuse me just one second before we proceed. Um, I fully support these projects. However, today is my wedding anniversary, so I'm <laughs> going to be departing. But my departure is no indication of anything other than full support for these projects. Thank you. <laughs> Happy, Thank you anniversary. Happy anniversary, Joe. <laughs> Yeah. 
Peter, good evening. How are you? Just state uh, name and address again, if you don't mind. Hi, Peter Goldstein, Bel Air Road. Um, I have questions about both facilities, but I'll step away to give other people a chance and come back later if I take too long. Uh, first, about the foster school facility. Uh, first and foremost, uh, what sort of uh, uh, design and systems are being put in place uh, to protect students in the event someone tries to get into the building that shouldn't? And if they do gain access to further protect uh, areas where students and faculty and administrators are. Great question. Uh, Ray or Gene, I'm not sure who you want to answer that. Sure, I can, I can start and, and, and maybe our uh, architect can, can chip in. So um, it's a great question. Um, I was involved in the, in the middle school project as well. And while we were designing that, uh, the tragedy in Connecticut happened. And we actually went back to the drawing board and spent more time and money to beef up the security in that school. So while we were approaching design in this school, it was uh, very important to us. Early on in the process, we sat down with public safety in town, the police chief, the fire chief, other members of the, of the public safety team, and talked to them about what was important to them in terms of access for safety um, and um, uh, you know what what kind of features we would include in the design in terms of security and access um, there are um, systems in place that are uh, universal throughout the town which public safety uh, can utilize in terms of um, uh, uh, you know the, the the access to the doors um, uh, some of the alarm systems um, the uh, uh, the glass that is uh, going to be used, uh, I believe, takes seven minutes to get through with an axe, um, which if someone is attacking and trying to get in, uh, will give time for public safety to respond. Um, there are, um, you know, there are cameras that are going to be installed throughout the building. Uh, there are a number of security features. Um, there's one, one access point to get into the main office. Uh, you've got to check in, you've got to be expected, you have to show ID, um, you get buzzed in, no one can just walk in and out of the building, um, you know, the other doors are locked at all times. Um, there, there are a number of security features that are in place uh, as part of the design. Okay. You'll probably answer the rest of these questions. So, uh, the current structure, um, there was no, there's no way to use any part of the current structure uh, with as part of the redesign or the rebuild. Right, so that was one of the options that we did look at. The MSBA required us to examine really three options, uh, a renovation of the existing school, an addition renovation, um, which would renovate whatever we could and then add on to it, and then the construction of a new school. The only portion of the existing building that could be saved and renovated is uh, the portion that's to the north, which is the kindergarten wing, um, because that's really the only portion that's above uh, and out of the future floodplain level. Uh, a, a large part of the school is actually in the floodplain now and is projected, most of the school is projected to be uh, at that level uh, in 50 years. Um, as a result of you know, that concern, uh, we're raising up the site to build the new school. Um, so it, it would really just be a portion of the building that could be saved, and that would need to essentially be gutted. We'd have to relocate students while we did that, swing space, overcrowding the other schools, more time, more money. Um, so that was a, 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 an option that was kind of ruled out early on. Uh, given the amount of uh, uh, space, the footprint of the building that you're allowed on that lot, uh, given all of the restrictions. Are you maximizing the amount of usable space in the building with the design? I think we are. Can the third floor, for example, cover the entire footprint uh, to give you more yeah. interior space? Yeah, I'd love to have Gene Raymond, our architect. Um, and, and let me just take this opportunity, remiss in not introducing our professionals who are here tonight. Gene Raymond from Raymond Design Associates and Chris Carroll from PMA Consultants, or OPM. They're both Hingham residents. They have personal stake in this project. Uh, it's being built in their backyards, essentially. Um, and I just love, Gene, to speak to the design uh, a little bit uh, uh, to your question. 
So uh, again, Gene Raymond, Raymond Design. Um, so the question was, is, is the site being used in the most efficient can you, manner possible? Are there ways to further maximize the footprint of the structure to, to incorporate more space? For example, the third floor it appeared in the drawings doesn't uh, extend over the entire footprint. Can you design this cost, you know, given the cost, uh, to, to maximize the amount of space on that footprint? Um, we've met, we, we, it's kind of a uh, juggling game. We have a very specific program and we have a uh, educational program, the spaces we have to incorporate in the building. And then the state sets a very specific size that the project has to meet, square footage, in order to participate in the grant program. Um, so the, the, there are a few reasons that portions of the first floor are out a little bit further than the second or third floor in some cases. Um, it's because, frankly, we didn't need the space on the upper levels. Uh, the first floor is always, everything wants to be on the first floor. The whole community wing, the gymnasium, the multi-purpose room, the admin, the youngest learners, pre-K, things like that. So the first floors tend to be um, larger. Um, and then we do our best to try to uh, make the building kind of as compact as possible uh, from an energy and a construction cost perspective. Uh, another design question. Can the gymnasium and the cafeteria be designed such that the entire space could be opened up uh, for uh, to each combined other? Combined use, yep. Um, the uh, committee looked at a couple different ways to, um, to configure the, there's a stage, a cafetorium, and the gymnasium. And what they decided was probably the best, you know, very flexible for both the community but the educational program was to put a two-sided stage and put it in between the cafeteria and the gymnasium. So for um, smaller, maybe musical productions, um, those could occur in the cafetorium. Uh, and then if you wanted to do a whole school gathering, you could have access to a stage proscenium from the gymnasium, which is much larger. Uh, the downside of putting a stage, the cafetorium, the cafeteria needs to have a stage to meet the uh, state grant requirements. So if you had combined those into one big room, the stage would have been way down at the end and it would have um, made the two spaces a little more, a little less flexible. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's all electric, is there? backup generator on site? Uh, there will be a backup generator on the site uh, and there'll be a diesel tank. So as Ray said, there's no, um, there's no gas service to the building. It is all electric, uh, but for times when uh, you know, the building loses power for whatever reason, uh, a lot of it will be on the emergency generator. And, and last question for, for the school. Uh, what are you doing to manage uh, construction costs uh, and schedule uh, to the plan to avoid overages either way? Yeah, the schedule is kind of one of the big drivers, believe it or not, of saving costs in this kind of inflationary environment. So the committee from day one has set a goal. It's been very aggressive and they've all worked very hard, which is why they have an early bid package and then a main package uh, to get the job out on the street and secure bids you know, as soon as possible. Um, we have constantly, uh, as I heard the police station did, we started out with a bigger building. We went back and refined program, remo removed spaces or made them smaller. Uh, and then we've also, as cost estimates have, have come in, because we do a, a series of uh, cost estimates throughout the process, um, we actually, over this last round, we made a, a number of decisions, set out a, a number of alternates and different ways of doing things on the site so that we could uh, keep the costs in line. Uh, and that was millions of dollars. Uh, I did have one more question about the school. So sure. uh, Downer Ave is probably the primary route in and out of Crow Point. Uh, right. Is there a plan to minimize the disruption, noise, uh, dirt? Uh, yeah, we spent a lot of time looking at the traffic. The nice thing about the school being constructed behind the existing school is that we're gonna have a long loop drive around the building. So all the traffic, 
and well, all the parking and kind of arrival and dismissal activity that's, that takes place right on the street right now is all gonna be well off the street. We're gonna be able to pull all the cars off the street. Uh, and, and during the construction period, you've got a, a plan to minimize disruption, disruption to residents in Cold Park? Um, yeah, we're kind of blessed with the site because there aren't a lot of residents. You know, it, it fronts the, uh, the salt marsh and Otis Hill behind it. So there are no direct butters. Uh, and this new loop drive that we're putting in as part of this phase one bid uh, will actually be the construction access road. So all the noise is going to be well, well back off down our avenue. Come back up here for this safety question. Uh, well, Chief, yeah, thank you for offering that, Peter. Does anybody else have any questions? Maybe you're. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank Peter. Thank you for offering that. Mr. Reardon, come on up. How are you? Good to see you. Good evening, Bill Reardon, 9 Steamboat Lane. Uh, one just sort of governance question and then a question regarding the public safety facility. The, the warrant for this, I'm assuming, will be hitting the streets momentarily? It'll be in your mailboxes on Tuesday, no later than Tuesday. And the second regards the public safety building. I've been very mindful as a longtime commuter back and forth to Boston. When we originally did the shipyard, the number of lights that as you pass through that section of town uh, I know that the bays for the public safety building for the fire all go out directly onto 3A, which is presumably going to add another set of lights and or a situation similar to the fire station in Quincy Point, where I think when the fire apparatus comes out, you know, a, a special light comes on and everything stops until the public safety can, uh, vehicles can get out. Is that the intent here as well? Chief, do you want to speak to that? Just let everyone know the plan. <laughs> uh, yes, the proposal does include adding one additional light on 3A, which, um, so right now there's a light at Shipyard Drive. There would be another one heading towards Weymouth um, that would be directly in front of the building. And the proposal allows for the apparatus to actually take a left onto 3A and head you know, south towards Cohasset, um, or actually technically east, I guess. Um, so that's the proposal. And uh, the, st the engineers or the traffic engineers are working with the state on that, on the configuration and how they'd be timed and everything else. So. Sir, come on up. Uh, Michael Nottage, uh, Hersey Street. Uh, what a great presentation. So I really enjoyed them, very informative. Uh, two questions on the school. Uh, first uh, has to do with, have we, uh, have we done any future planning on what the attendance will be in the future? I know the town like Hull is having a big decrease in student body. Will we see the same there? One question. Uh, so I believe the current population of Foster is, I think, 491. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, 421 this year? Is it 421? 408 now. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's a moving target. Um, so two years ago before COVID, uh, I think it was around 489. So we've seen a, a, a significant reduction because of COVID, kids going to private schools. Um, but what we've also seen is um, a tremendous influx of new young families in town with, uh, with young kids and kids on the way. I met uh, no fewer than 10 people a week ago who are expecting uh, babies um, who moved into the Crow Point neighborhood and whose kids will attend the new elementary school. Um, the new school has a set design enrollment of 605. That enrollment study was done before COVID by the MSBA, which took into account the anticipated uh, population growth uh, due to development that was ongoing in town. Uh, the Avalon at Shipyard, um, the Beale Street um, Alliance Project, the Cove, um, as well as, as some others. Um, so um, there is space to uh, accommodate increased enrollment that is anticipated despite the reduction in uh, existing enrollment due to COVID. And we do expect a lot of those students who have left the district to come back. Thank you. Uh, second question on the safety, uh, for the safety department. 
Uh, I noticed that the school committee had some grants coming to them. It seems to me, as I watch the news like everybody does, there seems to be a lot of money in Washington this day. Have we talked to Stevie Lynch or anybody, or a congressman, about trying to get some help with some of these public safety? They seem to have extra money around. Have we looked at that? Have we talked to anybody in their offices? I, I could take this if you'd like, and yeah. you guys can jump in as needed. Uh, so there's not a lot of money available for building public safety facilities. There's a lot of programmatic um, uh, grants available, federal, state, and, and elsewhere, for uh, public safety programs in general, but not so much for building uh, building projects has, has been our, our experience. On the, on the fire department end, um, probably about 15 years ago, there was some federal money available for it. It was a one-time deal, and that was it. There was hope at both the state and national level that that might become available again, um, especially with ARPA funds or anything else, and it did not come to fruition. Um, it actually got pulled off of uh, many of the, the, uh, the national level. So no, it's not really exist. So we have been in contact then with our federal yes, congressman. Yes, correct. They, okay. Yep. Last question, which a gentleman before me kind of spoke up, is the uh, 3A is in the summertime, tough to get down. Uh, with, especially with emergency equipment, I worry about that. But if we have this road diet, which is supposed to be happening, I hear it's passed to go one lane each way up Summer Street, I hear that's going to happen. Do you see problems getting emergency vehicles down 3A uh, in, the, in the summertime? It, I think it's a not horror show right now. One second. Um, sure, I'm, I'm up here. <laughs> um, no, it, part of the road diet was did also look at that as well, is access specifically. We were looking at some of the ambulances coming out of Hull, because as you know, they come up that road all the time. Um, and we did not find any impacts on response times or travel time to the hospital. Um, similar with this project, um, we do not anticipate any um, that, you know, it, Frankly, a lot of the, um, one of the reasons that this project was identified is most of our call volume is actually up in that vicinity anyways, you know. So between the shipyard, between the nursing homes or anything else, that's a lot of where our call volume for that district is. So. Well, thank you very much for taking my questions. Anyone else have any um, questions or comments? Diane, come on up. Good evening, Diane DiNapoli, 16 Gardner Street. This is a question probably for someone in the schools. So either um, Michelle, um, could you speak a little about the special ed classrooms that will be added, how many students might be in those classrooms, and perhaps the benefits of having those classrooms and bringing kids back to district? Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, I invited Dr. Adams to come as well because she has more specific information about it, but one of the goals sure, in, the sorry, one of the goals in building the school and having a larger footprint is that we will be able to bring some more special education services to educate our Hingham students in Hingham where we all hope and want them to be educated. Um, but I'll turn it over to Dr. Adams to give you a little bit more specifics. Yeah, the schools have been challenged for quite a bit um, in creating special ed programming because of lack of space. So the new foster building or the new elementary building provides um, spaces for that. Usually they're small class sizes, but students need um, spaces for occupational therapy, physical therapy. There are very specific needs um, and um, space needs that um, programs have, and we've been um, challenged by space in the development of these programs. Um, and the better, um, in the, the benefit of creating programs early with families is we really get families invested in the schools um, and, um, and develop strong relationships with them. And those are fostered in elementary in the early childhood years, and they continue into middle and high school. So that's the real benefit, is capturing families early and developing those strong relationships. Another benefit is um, the pre-K classrooms. Often those pre-K classrooms do service um, non-special needs students, but also special needs. We have an obligation to begin um, intervention services at the age of three, and we've been challenged by the lack of space um, to provide um, special ed services to our youngest learners. Um, we need to extend the time. Um, we're only have offering some half-day programs or shortened days. So this also helps us better reach those youngest learners that we've been also challenged.
Peter, you said he has a couple more questions. Come on back up. Thank you. Sorry, I don't mean to keep everybody here late. Um, uh, so if moving out of the North Street Station, if we sell it, can that money be earmarked for this project? For the safety project? It could be, yeah. There's a number of things we might do if we sell it, if we lease it. There's revenue opportunities there for sure. We would, uh, we would have to evaluate our needs at the time and the best way, and we would use it in the highest, best way. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the building's going to last 50 years. The town's going to grow quite a bit in 50 yeah. years. Yeah. Will this accommodate the added equipment, the added people, uh, yeah, so, and so on. All the architects will tell you 50 years. If this thing lasts less than 75, I didn't do my job well. well um, maybe, but, they may have said that about Foster School yeah, as well. No, I hear you. We, yeah. we want to be sure. It, it is built for expansion, for sure. Um, and, and a similar question, given the footprint that you're allowed to build on, are you maximizing the space in the building to, you know, to, to gain as much So we, I, I, I'll speak to this, but you guys may want to jump in. Um, we had the, the first effort we made when we were looking at the design needs was to sit down with the two chiefs and their teams and talk about their programmatic requirements and all the things that they needed, what they wanted, right? Different, different categories, needs and wants. And we walked through all of that at length, gave all that information to Bob Garrity and his team on the building committee and, um, and they designed the buildings around, around those programmatic needs. But I don't know if you guys want to add anything or not. <laughs> I'd ask the same question about safety, people getting into the building or safety if sure. there's a threat within the building. I'm sure you guys have both thought through that. That's why. That seems like you did. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give Steve a break. <laughs> yeah, so we did look at that uh, extensively with the architects and the design of the building is such that the public is, is um, when they come into the building, they'll be in that main lobby. There is a semi-public area that the like licensing officer would be off of animal control, interview rooms, et cetera, but the public will never be allowed uh, access uh, without an escort beyond that. So the, yeah. the inside of the building is, is secure. And even uh, trying to get in through the, the fire uh, bay doors and, and it, that's? Correct, yes. Okay. Yeah, every, there's access control on all the, on all the uh, doors inside the building as well as the exterior. So you can only get in with, with a key fob access. And, and the same situation with uh, managing to uh, budget and, and schedule applies here as it would to? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, it, it, yeah. We, we have a timeline that we have every intention of keeping to. That's in large part the role of the owner's project manager. We'll, we'll keep everybody on task. Uh, again, Bob Garrity and the building committee, we have our internal uh, uh, town engineer, J.R. Fry, will be involved along the way. But um, yes, everybody will be kept to a schedule. Yeah. Um, and I'd just like to say, lastly, I, I, I wholly support this foster school. Uh, my kids are long out of elementary school, but I think it's going to go a long way to, to making the program uh, more, even more desirable in the town. Uh, and the same with the public safety facility. I mean, we're all going to benefit from that. Uh, cost aside for both of these projects, there's huge benefit to all of us. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Anyone, anyone else have any questions or comments? All right, seeing none, I want to just thank uh, Tom and Michelle and Art for the tremendous work they put into tonight's presentation. And thank everybody for, for coming as well. And um, we have, as I said earlier, we, this is the first of three. So hopefully we'll see everybody at the next two. With that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. I'd second that motion. All those in favor by roll call, Liz? Aye. Nam and I as well. This motion is adjourned. Hope everybody has a great